It's the weekend and you have financial questions that need answering. That can only mean one thing. It's time for Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome to Jill on Money. Yes, indeed, we're back. Big weekend, January, it's cold everywhere. Well, not everywhere. If you're listening to us in Florida, I'm sure you're very happy or somewhere in the south. If you're listening to us, uh, you know, in Mexico, somewhere nice and warm, mmm, delicious. It's been super cold. Eh, it's winter. Uh, this is the program that takes the mystery out of your financial life. And thanks to uh, somebody who cornered me at a uh, brunch recently to say, literally in the corner, says, what's going to happen to the housing market this year? I don't know what's going to happen to the housing market this year. Uh, we still have one big problem about housing. I just want to say this. There's not a lot of homes for sale. We got low inventory. So prices probably rose. We don't have all the final numbers by about 6% in 2017. Aren't you glad you bought your apartment, Mark? When did you close? In 17 or 16? You closed in 17. Okay. Uh, but, you know, this GOP tax plan that went through, which limits the deductibility of state and local taxes and property taxes to a $10,000 cap total, some people believe that that change could negatively impact high-cost areas and high-cost states like New York, New Jersey, California. Everyone breathe. We don't know yet. So don't do anything. Relax. Right now, let's relax and go to our first caller. Ari is on the line from New York. Hi, Ari. Welcome to Jill on Money. What can we do for you? Well, uh, the reason I wrote was I wanted to ask your opinion on how to deal with an issue that I'm encountering as I'm getting a bit older. I'm uh, 50 years old, and I have, I'm a single man, although I'm likely going to get married sometime soon. And I, uh, I've been accumulating assets over the years. I'm a physician in New York City. And um, as I'm accumulating assets, what I'm learning is that I have more and more money in stocks than I do in bonds, and I'm turning 50 now, and so I'm thinking I need to rebalance a little bit, and I'm asking you for some advice regarding this. So you're going to get married, but right now single. Are you self-employed, or do you have an employer, like a hospital-based employer? No, I'm a hospital-based employee, mm -hmm. and um, just to give you an idea, I've accumulated money both in a 403 account, IRA account, as well as a taxable uh, account. Okay, give me the breakdown. 403B, how much? I have approximately $1.2 million. Okay, IRA, how much? Uh, about uh, about $100,000. Okay, taxable, how much? A little over $2 million. Okay, own a place or rent a place? I own the place. I have, uh, I've paid off half of the mortgage, but I still have a very substantial mortgage left with a 3.5% mortgage rate, 30-year loan. Okay, and how much is the outstanding mortgage? About $900,000. What do you figure the place is worth? Uh, approximately two to $2.2 million. Okay. And how much do you earn approximately? You don't have to give me the, you uh, know. I make over $400,000 a year. Okay. Right now, cash flow is good? Yeah. I, I Listen, I'm very pleased with my salary. I enjoy my work. I uh I really, my, my big question and the reason I wrote to you is that, you know, I'm 50 years old. From everything I've read about personal finance, I'm getting the impression that at this point, I should probably at least have approximately 20 or 25 percent of my assets in something fixed income like bonds. Mm -hmm. But because of the run up in the stock market, I now find myself with only about 15 percent in bonds in my taxable account. In my non-taxable, I'm pretty good because it's easy to rebalance without any tax consequences. You have big gains in the taxable account? That's correct. Are there so any, it's only gains, or do you have any losses anywhere? N not really, because I'm mm. a very long-term buy-and-hold investor, so pretty much anything I own has gains on it. Okay, how would you feel about this as a concept? I know that we all tend to do this. We tend to look at our investments account by account, right? You say, well, I'm doing well. I'm 50-50 in my 403B and I'm 50-50 in my IRA, but I only have 15% in my taxable on my bond side. And yet, if you were to make these big shifts, you would have to suck it up and pay a big tax. And I don't really want to make you do that. I, I, it seems like an unnecessary move. But what you could do 
is you could shift the 403B and the IRA and kind of make those your fixed income investments. In other words, you could say, all right, let's say that my taxable account is 85 stocks and 15 bonds. What if I were 85 or 90 percent in fixed in my 403B and my IRA and then the total like the total allocation looks like it should for a guy who wants to start reducing his risk. How how would you feel about that? Well, I think that I've read that that's one way to do it without incurring a tax. And I suppose that makes very good sense. Um, I, I, let me ask you this, Jill, for a man of 50 who's yeah. hoping to work at least another 15 years, mm-hmm. is a 20 to 25 percent bond allocation in line with what generally is recommended? Well, it would really it, it sounds to me like you have a higher risk tolerance uh, than most, because I think that, you know, I would say that an aggressive portfolio for someone who is 50 might be 80 20 or 75 25 but you know it could also be 70 30 that would be a growth portfolio it's really based on how much money you're going to need when you're going to need it and your ability to withstand risk so in my mind if you're saying to me i never panic i mean i feel like i want to kind of smooth the ride out a little bit and you start shifting more into the bond arena that's fine but if you are getting very antsy, if we speak in two months and we've had a you know twenty five percent move down in the stock market and you're ready to liquidate everything because you're freaking out, then I want you to get to a different allocation faster. But if you can absorb it and you really do have ten or fifteen years, you can slowly work towards a more balanced portfolio, and then it's fine. I feel like with a fifteen year time horizon, it's unlikely that I'm going to end up with less money with a relatively aggressive portfolio and I sort of sat through 2007, 2008 and 2000 and didn't really lose anything, just kept pouring in, you know, with automatic, uh, you know, investments uh, through various mutual funds. Well, then I have a $3.3 million portfolio. That's how I want you to look at it. And the way that I'm going to get access to the bond market is going to be in those tax deferred accounts. And so I shouldn't be worried that even though I'm going to bonds in the tax deferred, I'm sort of losing a lot of money, though, with that tax deferral on losing stocks. I guess the bottom line is... You're not losing money. Think of it this way. I got a pot of $3.3 million. I might even suggest to you that you will probably find better bond options inside of your 403B and your IRA, because then you're not going to be confined to saying, I want to get a muni. Right. Because you're a guy in your tax bracket you'd, and, and living in New York, you'd want a triple tax exempt bond and triple track. Well, I'm in. Right. So triple tax exempt bonds. There aren't that many that are good. You might even have better choices for fixed income inside of your retirement account because you can buy taxable bonds. Got it. Got it. Well, this has been greatly helpful, as I expected it would be from you. Fantastic. Thank you so much for calling, and uh, let us know if you have any other questions, okay? And thank you for everything you do. All right. If you, like Ari, have a question, give us a holler, 855-411-JILL. That's our phone number. Our email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. Eight five five four one one jill That's the number to call to have your financial questions answered. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. You're back with Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. Our phone number here is 855-411-JILL. Send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Hey, check out the new website. By the time this show airs, fingers crossed, we'll have it up and running. Uh, there you will be able to, what are our big main categories, Mark? It's watch, read, listen, and what's the other one? Isn't there one more? The big three. Watch, read, listen. That's yeah, probably good advice no matter what in life. Uh, big question for the year ahead. Will interest rates remain low? I'm very, I'm going to be intrigued by this because 
if we get faster than expected growth, the Federal Reserve could actually increase rates more than we expect. We're expecting three quarter point increases this year. I'm thinking maybe four, three or four, let's say, which is fine. We can absorb it. We absorbed three last year. There's the interest rates are still really low. So if uh, they are low, that's good. It's not great if you're a bond investor because uh, the bond market's going to be changing. Okay, right now, let's get to a caller. It's Diane in Portland. Hi, Diane. What can we do for you? Hi, Jill. So nice to meet you. Um, I guess I reached out because we are wondering if it is, we're, it's time to seek the services of a financial advisor. Um, we've done a little bit of research, seen some of your guidance on it, started looking around on the NAPSA website, yep. et cetera. Um, and, you know, I, we have some assets that we have, savings that we have, and some extra investments. Mm-hmm. And just looking for advice, but um, having a little bit of sticker shock in terms of most of the places we look at that we only charge the 1%, and um, it's still, you know, a significant amount, and we're just on the wondering if it's worth fighting the bill and if we'll get that back in space or if we seek a robo-advisor, something like that, and send it and forget it. Um, you know, look, it, it totally is up to you. You're, you know, the, the thing that's funny about whether it's worth it or not, I mean, if you are, you know, really busy and you're not paying attention to your stuff, then it's almost like, wow, any fee I pay is probably worth it. But that said... I'm hearing that it was more expensive than perhaps you thought. So just tell me about how much money you have invested right now. Um, so we have um, been pretty aggressive with saving. So we have about a little over a million in some 401ks and IRAs, and then um, actually one and a half in non-kind of designated retirement Okay. Fun. How is it being managed right now? You, you you have current 401ks and you guys are both contributing to them? Yes, fully contributing to 401ks. And the other one is unfortunately just sitting in a um, basically a money market fund. And we sold a piece of property and haven't really decided what to do with it. And, um, yeah, the rest of it is in 401ks, IRAs, um, some of like a brokerage accounts, but not really doing much. Okay. And uh, how old are you? 41. And spouse? Uh, 46. Okay. Kids? Yes. Two kids, a six-year-old and a four-year-old. Okay. You're busy. You got your hands full. I'm hearing it. I got it. Okay. Uh, So there's two things that come to mind. One is, you know, do you really need a comprehensive financial plan. And it sounds to me like you might be ready for that. Um, The big tell for me was like, oh, yeah. Oh, by the way, we have a bunch of money sitting in cash, which is usually like we're scared to do anything because we don't really have a plan. And therefore it's sitting in cash, which is, by the way, what you should do, because don't just throw money at doing something without a game plan. So the question is, you know, should you hire someone to create a plan for you and then you execute the plan, right? You could conceivably say, I want to pay someone 10 grand to create a beautiful financial plan. And then that person will tell me exactly how to invest the money. But you um, would have to actually execute the plan yourselves. The the beautiful thing, I guess, about having these options is that you, you kind of can customize it based on who you are. Are you guys the type that just want to hand it over and say, just do it? Give me a sense of that part. We're probably in the middle. Um, we actually, my previous employer had a certified financial planner kind of on staff from a big um, bank that they would allow for employees. Mm-hmm. So we, we, we almost executed on it, but we ended up moving and kind of changing our life, doing life changes. So that hasn't been refreshed. I would say, you know, that is one option we've thought about is just getting a, you know, fairly comprehensive but financial plan and just executing ourselves. Um, I think we would we'd be able to do that. I don't know if we would. We don't really want to be. We're not really interested in investment. We're not going to be, you know, looking at the market and trying to game it or anything like that. So in that sense, we're a bit of a set it and forget it. Um, yeah, but that's, so that's that's good because I almost feel like some people will hire an advisor because th- they'll say, I know myself and I'm going to mess with this stuff and I need someone to protect me. 
right? So that, that, that human being can be really important to protect you from yourself. But if you're not going to fall prey to that, maybe your first step would be to find a fee-based person to look at the old plan, refresh it, and go through this whole process, make sure you got the kids stuff figured out, the education stuff figured out, make all these pieces and do some cash flow planning with you. And then maybe you try to do it yourself and you could do it yourself. You know, obviously you could use a robo or you could, you know, use your Vanguard or your Fidelity, but you will, you know, you'll get some consolidation probably in this process and you get this thing to work. Then what you could also do if in a year from now, you're like, oh, my God, we really didn't do it. We stink. Then you go back and then you hire someone to manage your money, you know. And, and I think right. that maybe that's the game plan for you guys, because I'm hearing that maybe you actually are ideally suited to manage your own money. And maybe you can right. execute that in, you know, you could do it through a robo. You could do it through a discount broker. But I think that the customized advice is where you want to spend your money, at least for this moment. And I think once you have that game plan you can always turn to the person who you've hired and said, hey, you know what? We're not doing this. This is too much stuff. You do it. And we'll pay you the, you know, let's see. If, I mean, if you got a million and a half bucks, we'll pay you the three quarters of one percent. Maybe you got two million because they're not going to manage your 401k for you. Though, so take that out of the right. equation. But so if you have two million bucks, you say, ah, oh, you know what? Here's two million bucks. I'll pay you, you know, a half, three quarters of a percent to do it. And uh, that's what we're going to do. I think you start with the plan and pay for the plan. And by the way, you know, with a net worth of two and a half million dollars to spend 10 grand to do a plan, that doesn't seem obscene to me. That seems kind of smart. And that would be my okay. first step that I think I would take. Okay. And then while I have you on the line, Why not? I have a micro, micro question. Sure. Um, we have, um, we have uh, two cars and we have loans on those. And they're both at very low percentage um, interest rates. Yeah. But we have the cash to pay them off. Right. And I I think we should just pay them off because we don't plan on changing cars until these cars, you know, live at the end of their glorious lives. Uh, my spouse disagrees and he thinks the interest rates are so low um, and that I guess theoretically we could make more on if we invested that same money. Okay. Wait a second. But, uh, but you got a bunch of money sitting in cash right now, right? Yes. What's the amount that's what's the interest on the cash account? Oh, um, I mean... Uh, Zero, uh, right? Right now, yeah, it's like really low because it's in a savings account. Okay, and what's the and what's the interest that's on the car loans? One is 2.9, one is 1.9. All right, tell Big Shot over there, the husband, to pipe down, pay off the loans, and just say, oh, look, if you ever invest, <laughs> if you ever invest, you'll do better probably than 1.9%. But let's say combined, you're paying 2.5% for these loans. Pay these darn things off. You're paying, I hate paying okay. any amount of money. I just hate right. paying anything for a depreciating asset. And and that to right. me is the issue. Just, just pay it off and be done. Okay. And it's probably not big money. And go off and get yourself a financial plan and then get the rest of that cash to work, okay? Perfect. Thank All you so much, Jill. Okay, we'll get back to more of your questions. If you are wondering how to reach us, it's easy. 855-411-JILL or send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at JillOnMoney. We'll be right back. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. Have a question? Call or email anytime. 855-411-JILL or ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. You're back with Jill on Money. I'm holding a sign up for Mark. He's not looking. Can you... I, I just... I'm in love with that voice. God, it's amazing. Uh, okay. You're back with the show that takes the mystery out of your financial life. And if, let's get through some emails. We got a bunch right in uh, December, and I wanted to make sure we got through them. This is from Mark in Pennsylvania, who is 42 years old, who, uh, due to health reasons, is not working. Had to move back in with his family due to his situation. He's single. He's not married. He's got no kids. Um, he's selling uh, 
some he's selling a, a a mobile home which should sell for 10 grand he's going to need some of the money to help live off but he wanted to invest some like a cd not too risky the problem is cds have such low returns uh, so here's the problem it is true cds have a terribly low return on the other hand you pointed out the issue mark that is most important that everyone needs to pay attention to and that is when you know you're going to need money and when you just have a, a bit to invest, whether you're old, young, doesn't matter, but you know that you really have to keep it safe, you have to keep it safe. And the price for keeping it safe right now is really low interest. So go on to depositaccounts.com, see what the possible alternatives are, put it in something safe and don't touch it. And that's it. You're going to do the best you can. There's nothing else you need to do. And that's the most important thing to remember. OK, so in my mind, again, many people try to outsmart themselves. They try to figure out, oh, my God, how can I get more money? How can I put this money to work? Blah blah. blah. It's safe money. That's all you need to worry about. Uh, here's another question. I love this one from Stephen. Uh, I'm driving during the show. Hope you can help. I hope he's doing elect- what, Siri. Siri, type this. Do you use Siri, Mark? I don't use Siri either. I think I should do that, though. Anyway, here's what Stephen wants to know. If someone has fifty dollars or $100,000 in cash, post-tax, saved over decades, how to deposit uh, without triggering a tax event? Be totally upfront at the teller desk? Is this common? Wait a minute. Is he saying that he has fifty grand in cold, hard cash? Aha. Uh-huh. Uh, okay. Here's the problem. After 9-11, there is something called the Patriot Act. And the Patriot Act made it very difficult to just deposit cash because what the bank has to do is be able to say, we understand where Stephen got this money. We understand the source of the funds. So let's just pretend that everything happened for all the right reasons, that Uh, You know, you were maybe somebody who, um, I don't know, like you did something uh, on the side and someone paid you cash. Okay, let's say you're, uh, okay, let's say you're a chef. And for your friends, you you made them dinner and you started catering events and people paid you in cash. And all of a sudden the cash piles up, piles up, piles up, piles up, right? And you never invested it during the, uh, or deposited it, but you got 150 or 100 grand in cash, in cash your house in a safe hopefully now if you go to the bank you try to deposit it they're gonna say okay prove to us that's how you got the money now here's the thing (laughs) chances are you didn't pay tax on it so there's nothing you can do with that money first of all you're probably not gonna be able to deposit it because many of these institutions they're gonna flag you and say well we can't put that money in there so there's nothing you can do Uh, the the only thing you could potentially do is I guess I don't even know this but this would be an accounting question maybe I'd ask one of my smart accounting friends that that you could potentially say to the IRS over time I've accumulated this money I never paid tax on it here's how much money I have here's how I made it I never got a W-2 I never got a 1099 I want to pay tax on it and that's it otherwise you're just gonna have to spend it on stuff it's not common, but you can just spend it. I'm, I'm presume. Mark, are you presuming that he got it from uh, legitimate means or not mer- legitimate? He thinks that Mark thinks that Stephen got paid under the table for something. Look, you get paid under the table. This is the downside. You're not going to be able to deal with this. Yeah, you could use it to just pay your expenses. I knew somebody who was in the restaurant business who had a pile of cash. And what he did was, that's exactly what he did. He just paid for everything and uh, kind of used it up. And, you know, maybe what you do is you pay every expense out of that and then you start socking away as much money as you can with your legitimate money. I don't know. It's still tax evasion. It's not a good thing. Um, okay, here is from Patricia. Is a reti- retired from AT&T in 2003 Uh, Patricia took a lump sum, not a pension, and she invested her money, 
And, uh, oh, brother. And then in 2009, because of stock market crat- cratering, she lost 175 grand. At that time, I requested from my broker to invest $20,000 in gold. The following year, as I'm sure you're aware, the price of gold climbed. Feeling pretty pleased with the investment, I asked my broker why I wasn't seeing the increase in my portfolio. She did not respond. I went to her office. I asked again. She evaded. I became so disappointed and angry. I pulled what remained out of my account and left the firm. That was in 2013. I'm asking, I'm, I'm writing to ask you, is it far too late to report this to Waddell and Reed or anyone else? I feel stupid, frankly, that I placed blind trust in this broker. I'm not blaming her for the loss of the stock market, but had she invested the 20000 I could have made a nice sum. Well, I mean, you could go tell this. This is what I would do. When you have a problem with a, a, a financial person, you what you can do is you can go straight to the branch manager and tell the branch manager exactly what happened. That's it. And don't make it really uh, don't accuse anyone of anything. You can just say, like, I don't get it. I don't know what happened. For all we know, this bro- probably this broker is gone, long gone. But I think it's worth putting the complaint in, saying, telling them what happened and seeing if I, I don't know if there's like a statute of limitations. There probably isn't on this kind of stuff. Maybe there is, but it's not three or four years. It's more than that. So I think what you would do is essentially go in, tell the branch manager what happened, ask whether that broker is still there or not and see if you can. Can you prove that you asked her to buy gold? That's the other thing. If there's an email, that would be really good. All right. Thanks for writing. If you've got a financial question, we want to hear from you. 855-411-JILL. Send us an email. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. Follow Jill on Twitter and Instagram for more personal finance content. Just use the handle at Jill on Money. Now, back to the show. You're back with Jill on Money. Mark, did you write that liner? That's fabulous. He wrote them all. Mark is the best producer in the world. He's actually the executive producer of uh, the show. There is no producer, but he is. Well, actually, you hold many titles. You are the executive producer, the producer, the writer, the editor. Anything else you want to put on there? Webmaster? Content curator? I like that also. Anyway, he is the best. I did give him a good bonus, but here's what happened. I give Mark a check. We usually, like, our our relationship is usually done electronically. I write a check. I put it in a nice card. And I said, do me a favor. Just put this in the bank before the end of the year. Because I'd like to, like, get the deduction for 2017 as a business expense. And uh, he waits till December 31st, like a Momo, and he gets sends me a picture from the bank. And I am the biggest moron in the universe because I somehow dated that check like December 15th, 2015. I'm not kidding you. I put 2015 on that. What was I thinking? I think what I was doing, I think I know what I was doing, which was I was writing all of my uh, Christmas checks. And I have a huge spreadsheet that I look year by year what I've given everybody. Meaning like the doorman, the all the porters, the guys in the garage, Mark. And I think I had the 2015 page open and I looked up and I wrote that. Anyway, suffice to say, I owe Mark a Christmas bonus because I told him to just shred that check. Maybe did you just keep it for fun so you could tease me for the rest of our lives together? Hmm, probably. All right. If you've got a financial question, 855-411-JILL. And uh, Deborah writes that, uh, let's see, she's just turned 65 and she's going to retire at the end of this year. She says, I have a SEP account at work with Merrill Lynch. I just signed over control of this account upon my retirement to Merrill. Mark, what do you think that is? I just signed over control of this account. Well, what it sounds to me is that she so she's going to retire at the end of the year and that maybe she's hired a broker to help her out. She's 65 percent equities, 25 percent fixed, and the rest is in cash. All right. I'm not I'm down with that. 
That's okay. I mean, I'd probably be more like 50-50. I don't know. Anyway, she's got 210 grand in the account. She's got a car loan. It's going to be paid off at the end of the year. She makes $42,000 a year. And she contributes 17% of that $42,000 into a SEP. And she gets a match of 3%. What am I doing right and what am I doing wrong? Let's talk about what you're doing right. 17% of 42 grand. That's darn good. Um, she's married. Her husband's retired. She's in good health. Do I need Merrill Lynch? Now, nah, let's get to what you're doing wrong. I don't know if you're doing it wrong, but here's what I would think is important, Deborah. Do you really need to pay somebody for this account? In other words, when you retire, you're going to have some options. And one of the options is that you can roll over that 200 something thousand dollars into an IRA rollover account, right? So from a SEP, it just turns into an IRA in your name. And you can have that account anywhere you want. And presuming that you want to keep it cheap and you don't want to pay Merrill Lynch or anybody to do that, there's a couple of options. You could roll it over and say, go to Vanguard or T. Rowe Price or TD Ameritrade, wherever you want. And then in that account, you could basically pick three or four index funds. And I I don't know if you're going to need any money out of this account. I don't know if you're going to need to be pulling money out. But if presuming, you know, you sort of need it to grow a little bit and you need some of the money. I think I'd be more like 50 percent equities and 30 percent fixed and the rest in cash. I would just pull the risk back a little bit. Now, let's say you don't want to do that much work. Then what you could do is you could take the account and you could do it all electronically. You don't have to have a person. You can go to what is called an online investment advisor like Betterment. Betterment is the sponsor of my podcast, by the way. Wealthfront is another one. Personal Capital is another one. And Vanguard actually has a robo, uh, a, an online platform. They're also, also called robo-advisors. So what you may find is going either a, into an index fund environment or choosing an online platform will be a lot cheaper than Merrill Lynch. So what I would do is take a step back, wonder, you know, really ask yourself, do I need this person, whoever this person is, and how much will it cost? I mean, you you can also ask, the, you know, hey, how much am I paying for this? And once you get that information, you might be able to make a better decision. My guess is that if you don't need financial planning and you don't need ongoing advice, then choose a cheaper alternative. That's that would be my advice. And um, so you're not doing anything really wrong. It sounds like you're doing a lot of things right. And that's great news. So I absolutely positively think that the most important message I can give you is you're saving. You're doing a great job saving and keep up that good work. Don't take too much risk. Keep your investing costs low. Every fraction of a percent that you save, it goes to your bottom line. You're listening to Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, 855-411-JILL. Send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. We'll be right back. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, she's all over the place. Go to JillOnMoney.com to find it all. Now back to the show with Jill Schlesinger. All right, you are back with Jill on Money. And uh, you know what happens when you are in my business, which is uh, you talk about money all the time. All of your friends and colleagues ask you questions constantly. And Mark just was making fun of me because I share many of these with him. Not their names. I'm just saying I share their questions with you. 
Uh, and here is one from uh, a friend in the building who said, uh, my daughter is trying to save for her ch- children's college education plan. Now I know there are some changes in 529 plans. What are the changes? Are they still good? What should we do? Okay. So 529 plans did change. We talked about um, 529 plans forever, just about this fabulous way to save for education, meaning you put an after-tax dollar in, the money grows without any taxes due, no accumulation. And when you pull the money out, so let's say you put $1,000 in and it grows to $1,500. If you do that in a normal investment account, you have to pay capital gains on the 500 bucks. But when it's inside of a 529 plan for education and it's that the $1,500 you pull out to pay for education, it's a qualified expense, no tax due. It's kind of like a Roth, but for education. Uh, Because of changes in the GOP tax plan, 529 plans can now be used for, guess what? Not just college. We used to call them the college savings vehicle. Let's just call them an education savings vehicle. So you can use it for private high school, maybe even like a private parochial school, grammar school, whatever it is. I don't know if you can use it for like preschool. Mark, we should probably figure that out, like some fancy preschool program or something like that. But anyway, I love the 529 plan. Keep using it to save for education. And uh, don't let anyone talk you into using a plan that is expensive. Use the one offered through your state or... Nevada, Utah, Alaska, Maryland, those are very good programs as well. You're listening to Jill on Money. Stay tuned. We've got Slate Money's Felix Salmon. He's up next, and he's fun. He's got a great accent, too. Jill on Money. We'll be right back. It's the weekend, and that can only mean one thing. You're listening to Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. You're back with our number two of Jill on Money. How are you? What's happening? It's been a uh, good show so far, and it's going to get even better. Got a great guest lined up for you. Felix Salmon, I actually, um, how did I start to, I think I started reading Felix when he was at Portfolio Magazine, maybe, or I don't know. I feel like I've been reading him for quite some time. He's very smart. He's a journalist. He um, uh, actually uh, uh, hosts a podcast called Slate Money. He's very excellent. Um, He is really smart about lots of different like sort of thorny financial issues which I love because you know that's kind of the what we like to do here too which is take apart some crazy stuff and make it palatable to you Uh, so I invited Felix on to come on the program came into the studio laid down a beautiful interview and uh, we started the interview with one of my favorite questions so stay tuned here is Felix Salmon on Jill on Money Felix, we start the program off with a very important question. You ready? I'm never ready, but I love important questions. Best financial decision you've ever made? Oh, I have an answer to that one. This was in 2001, and I was working for a newswire called Bridge News, which was shortly to go bankrupt, and they fired me. And um, it was all, I was in a bit of a, you know, that state when you're unemployed and you worry that you might have to leave the country because you're out of visa status and that kind of stuff. And what I did with the zero money that I had was I went out and bought this shiny new titanium MacBook Pro, the very first MacBook Pro, which was the titanium one, the silver one. It was super sleek and it's it's, it's like it's in MoMA. It's one of the most amazing machines. It's very sexy. And I decided that this was going, you know, I was actually going to do this thing of freelancing. And I took it down to Chile to go to a conference of the Inter-American Development Bank. And that 
machine not only sort of made me friends because I think it was the first MacBook Pro in Chile, but it also just drove my entire career for about seven or eight years after that. And I used to tell people over and over again that like the best thing you can do with a buck is to buy an Apple computer rather than buy Apple stock. Now, I think in hindsight, buying Apple stock might have been quite good as well. But it was this productivity tool which really made my career for years. I like that. I like the like the investing in the human capital thing. Yeah. It's a good deal. And also, like the one thing I, I try and tell people, although they never listen to me, is that having a good, fast computer pays for itself in a million different ways that you never really notice. And people are incredibly reluctant to upgrade their computers for reasons I never quite understand. It's not that expensive compared to like your total annual expenses. And you shouldn't consider your computer to be, oh, I bought this three years ago and it was perfectly fine then, so it should be perfectly fine now. Just it, feel free to upgrade your computer. It makes you much more productive and much happier. It's, it's worth it. Felix, why did I have you come on the show? Because you know so much about so many things. You're also sort of a, a contrarian slash curmudgeon, curmudgeon, which I love. Yeah. You like curmudgeon better? I mean, I, I don't think I'm smart enough to be a contrarian, but I'm definitely a curmudgeon. Okay, excellent. You are have the lens of a European. You were born where? I was I was born in England. I have... UK and German and American citizenship. I have yeah, three to marry different, into that, huh? Three different citizenships, um, but there's only one of them which I have any particular sort of pride in right now, and that's the German, which was not something I ever really expected. <laughs> How do you have German Through citizenship? Through my mother. Aha. Uh -huh. I basically grew up with her in England. She okay. she um, met my dad in California, but then they brought me up in in England. One of the things that you have maybe have like that European lens around is this idea of corporate responsibility as well as the notion that you can be a company and not just care only about your shareholders. And so I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that. So Germany is really good at this. If you look at German companies, they always have a bunch of worker representatives on the board. If you look at Germany's parliament, the Green Party is a very powerful force. It's not just a bunch of like environmental kooks that no one listened to. And it is just generally understood that companies have a wide range of what, you know, Davos types love to call stakeholders, which is one of my least favorite words. I don't really understand what it means. But ultimately, when you're in charge of a company, you are responsible for a bunch of different things. And if you talk to entrepreneurs, especially after a couple of drinks, you know, what they will say is it was all fun and games when we were small. And now I realize as the owner and CEO of this company with X hundred employees, I am responsible for families. I'm responsible for feeding children and keeping them housed and getting them through school and this kind of stuff. And it's a big, important responsibility. And there's this idea among certain types of stock buyers and stock market watchers in America that CEOs really shouldn't feel that responsibility to their employees and that all they really should care about is their shareholders. And I think that's trivially false. It's not just the employees. You know, you've got various vendors, people who you buy stuff from who rely on you and you should treat them well and you shouldn't do mean things to them if you, you know, if you want a long term relationship with them, you should trust each other and you should be able to say your vendor, if he's been selling you something for the past 20 years, you know, you don't just cut that off immediately. That kind right, of Right, because I got a cheaper deal from the guy down the street. Exactly. Mm. So there's a bunch of different things. And then underpinning the whole thing is we are the stewards of this planet and we have to look after it. So when you're running a company, you do have to weigh out a whole bunch of different responsibilities that you have to the various different companies and individuals that you're connected to. It's not just about your balance sheet and the shareholders who have claim on the residual profits after your debts paid off. Like, yeah, I mean, fine, they're in the mix somehow, but they shouldn't be above everything else. So I blame one person specifically as the cheerleader of that bad trend, and that's Jack Welch. Because I found him to be the most obnoxious cheerleader for quote-unquote shareholder value. 
as if nothing else mattered, that you must put your shareholders before all else. So, yeah, so they called him Neutron Jack because he would explode these neutron bombs basically outside the various offices of General Electric and the buildings would remain, but all of the employees would be vaporized. And you're like, that's not good. And then obviously he turned GE into a incredibly leveraged bank. And then the minute, minute the financial crisis blows up, it needs to get a massive government bailout. And none of this is good business. None of this is good for the planet. And I guess it was good for Jack Welch, who managed to reinvent himself as some kind of corporate guru. But yeah, no, I'd really rather not. And you don't see that, honestly, in places like Germany. All right, we'll get back to our interview with Felix Salmon in just a second. It's Jill on Money, 855-411-JILL. Send an email, askjill at jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. Have a finance question? There are many ways to reach the show. You can call anytime at 855-411-JILL, send an email to askjill at jillonmoney.com, or tweet a question on Twitter using the handle at jillonmoney. Just use the hashtag AskJill. You're back with Jill on Money. This is the program that takes the mystery out of your financial life. And uh, who better to help than... Felix Salmon. He is a financial journalist, overall super smart guy. Um, And, you know, one of the reasons I had actually uh, called Felix or contacted Felix was I heard him do something which was really interesting. Here's a financial guy. You know, he's totally a capitalist. Talk about companies and corporations and what they owed their not just their shareholders, but their communities, their municipalities, their workers. And there are different kinds of designations these days that help you understand whether or not you are investing or working for a company that looks beyond its shareholder value as the primary metric to judge success. So in this segment with Felix Salmon, we're talking about B corporations. Check it out. When we talk about some of the U.S. companies that are trying to sort of do good, there is this um, this thing called a B corporation where like an Etsy is like, we're doing good. What is that whole so, thing? So the one which people probably know the best and which has been around for the longest as a B corporation, B corporations are relatively new, is um, Patagonia. Ah, yes. And Patagonia is founded and run by a guy who more or less has this German style idea that you should look after your employees and your vendors and your factory workers and the planet and yes, also your shareholders. He doesn't have a publicly listed stock, so that makes it a little bit easier for him. Um, But yeah, a bunch of people do own the company. And all of these people understand that they have a bunch of responsibilities to a bunch of different principles. And so they run the company according to those principles. And they reckon that if they're true to themselves and true to their principles, the company will do just fine. Obviously, Different, as you said, for a private versus a public company, although even private companies, these unicorns, I mean, we can just look no further than Uber, can do some really awful things as no, private no one, companies No too. one is saying that, that private companies are inherently better than public companies. And in fact, the opposite could be true. And one of the interesting things about public companies is when you go public, you start having much more of a public profile. And you find that on the CEO councils and places like that, it's the CEOs of the public companies who tend to start standing up for the environment and stuff like that before the CEOs of the private companies do. I want to shift gears for a second because we're talking about stocks, but as an asset class, you're not a great fan of the stocks. 
Oh, as an asset class, I am a fan of stocks. You like the stocks. I, as an asset class, I think that stocks ultimately give you the is is ultimately the asset the only asset class which will give you long term significant positive real returns. Okay, so now let's talk about how there are some people who still believe that they can pick the best stocks out there. Can they? Yes. I, I mean, let's say that there are a thousand people out there who believe that. Like, statistically speaking, probably one of them, through luck or judgment, is going to be able to pick the best stocks for whatever your time horizon is. I mean, right now is interesting. If you look at the actively managed funds, at least when it comes to the big cap companies in America, most of those actively managed funds are outperforming the stock market. And people are going, oh, look, active management works. As, as you increase that time horizon to two years or five years or 10 years or 20 years or however long you expect to be invested for, the number of managers who can outperform just shrinks and shrinks every year until eventually it basically reaches zero. And what's fascinating is that it seems like you can put that kind of research in front of people over and over again, and still they want to believe that there is some wizard behind the curtain who can tell you how to get to Oz or to get back from Oz, that they want to believe that there is something more to investing than buying an index or an index ETF. Why is that? Historically speaking, if you look at the people who were invested in the stock market, they were basically 50-something white guys who played a lot of golf. <laughs> If you're a fifty, if you're a fifty-something white guy who plays a lot of golf, just by dint of the fact that a you have enough time to pay, play a lot of golf and b you have enough money to play a lot of golf, you have too much time and too much money on your hands, right? And investing in the stock market is for those kind of people. It's a hobby, just like golf, and it is it is expensive, just like golf, and it is pleasurable and it makes them happy, just like golf, and if they didn't do it, they would have more money, they would be better off financially, but they enjoy it. And no one gives them grief for spending a whole bunch of money to play golf. And I, in a weird way, I kind of don't give them grief for spending a whole bunch of money to invest and to lose money on stupid stock picks. If they want to do that, all power to them. It's a hobby and people need a hobby. And fine, they have a bunch of money they can lose, they can lose it. I personally have zero interest in either golf or picking stocks. And I know that as a hobby, if I take up a hobby, I'm going to choose one which is a cheaper and be more fun. You have a lengthy and um, old relationship with the the great Mr. <laughs> the Mooch. Scaramucci. Anthony Scaramucci. Now, what, so how did you, so first of all, what is it, like you guys got into it a while back, right? The very first year I went to Davos, which is this ridiculous, ridiculously stupid conference which happens in Switzerland. And do you January. still go to that? I, every year I'm, I say it's my last year, so I, as far as I'm concerned, I'm not going back. Of course, but you will. But you never I, mm. I, I, They do drag me back. So the very first year I went was like major financial crisis zone and a bunch of people were very careful not to do the conspicuous consumption thing mm -hmm. because it would look bad. Right. They, so into this conspicuous consumption void, there was there used to be this big wine party, which was thrown every year by this thing called the Wine Forum. And then they decided to cancel that because it looked bad. Mm. And the mooch heard about this and said, I know what I'll do. I'll come in and do the conspicuous consumption by a gazillion dollars worth of incredibly expensive wine, pour it for all of my hedge fund friends, and then no one else is doing the conspicuous consumption thing, so I will stand out. Uh -huh. So he did that. Okay. I write about this party for my blog, and I call it the most obnoxious party in Davos because it was, and he got upset at that, and that was the first time that he tried to fire me. There were various other times. There are so many times where people will say to me, like, he's a hedge fund manager, and I'm like, wait, first of all, a fund of funds is not a hedge fund manager. And second of all, he's not managing the fund of funds. So... Yeah, it, he, is, he isn't 
a hedge fund manager, and he's not even a fund of funds manager. He is just an asset accumulator. He goes on the television and tries to get his company's name in front of people so that they will give him their money. We'll get back to our interview with Felix Salmon in just a minute. For now, you are listening to Jill on Money. And remember, this is the program where money is not scary. It's not boring. We have a little bit of fun here, you know? And I'm a certified financial planner. I'm even the senior CFP board ambassador. And Mark's studying for his CFP. What's it? What module are you in, Mark? You're almost done. He's in his fifth module. I think there's seven. He's almost done. Anyway, we love taking your questions. So uh, give us a holler. 855-411-JILL. Send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. And when we return, more of our interview with Felix Salmon. We'll be right back. If you've missed any part of the show or want to check out a past show, go to JillOnMoney.com for more great personal finance content. You're back with Jill on Money. This is the program that takes the mystery out of your financial life. You know what I love? I can't believe I kept this from last year, but I had a whole rundown of U.S. stocks and markets for 2016, and now I have the exact same thing for 2017, and it's actually have the printed copy. In 2016, just in case you were not paying attention, uh, 2016, the best return of all the assets out there was natural gas in 2016, which returned 57.6%. And you'll be happy to know if you were so blinded by that return that you had to jump in. In 2017, it was down by 20.7%. Isn't that funny how that happens? Whatever was last year's winner can become this year's goat. In fact, uh, I looked this up. Uh, the the bottom three performers of, you know, not every single asset class, but uh, natural gas was down 20.7% in 2017. Sugar was down 22.3%. And orange juice was down 31.4%. So breakfast may have been a bit cheaper for you. Who knows? Anyway, again, something that happened last year And all the good times that occurred in 2017 does not mean that you should be complacent in the year ahead. There are always risks that do abound. And there's regular old risks, which, you know, like a, you know, a company, something bad can happen in a company. But there are larger risks, which are are absolutely out of your control. I understand that. But there are things that we should be thinking about. There are things that we should protect against and maybe be um, not only thinking that that's the, out, the the ultimate outcome, but it's a possibility. That's what I wanted to hear from our guest, Felix Salmon. What risks lie ahead for all of us? So here's more of our interview with Felix Salmon. Is there something that you see in the offing that should prick our ears up that we should pay attention to? So since I've been in America, we've had two big crashes. Um, there was the big dot-com Go crash home. of 2000. <laughs> And then there was obviously the financial crisis of 2008. Um, The financial crisis of 2008 had many, many causes, and you can argue for hours. No, come on, let's just let's do the the top three. At heart, there were roughly 250 billion dollars of bad subprime loans, which lenders made, and they didn't need to own, and they went bad, and it caused a bunch of ripple effects. The thing which fascinates me about that is. The ripple effects were systemic and hugely damaging globally and put the entire, like, wiped trillions of dollars of wealth off the planet. And really, the 
the whole planet hasn't really recovered 10 years later. $250 billion of bad assets is also, weirdly, the amount that the market capitalization of Cisco dropped in one day in March 2000. Mm. So the lesson here is you can have $250,000 of wealth like blinking out of existence in the dot-com crisis and then you know, a few people in San Francisco lose their jobs and a few people's 401ks go down before they go back up again. And ultimately, the world goes on and it's kind of no big deal. You can have the same amount of wealth disappear in the mortgage part of the economy and the repercussions are just tremendous. So it's not really a question of where is the money going to get lost? Because sometimes people lose money and it doesn't matter. And sometimes people lose money and it matters a lot. It It matters how much leverage there there is, and basically, is it rich people losing money, which is fine, or is it poor people losing money, which is not fine? So um, what do you think about the idea that the student loan debt that has emerged and the packaging of that debt, is is that a potential warning that's out there at $1.4 trillion or not? Here's my favorite factoid about student loan debt. It is going up at a rate of $100 billion a year. So it's enormous. And there's no end to how big it's going to get. And it has already had implications in terms of how um, the people who've been graduating with all of this debt are able to lead their lives, what kind of jobs they can take, what kind of houses they can buy, where they can afford to live, all of this kind of stuff. It's reshaping America in ways both good and bad. I mean, it is actually causing probably more urbanization. You know, it's not going to cause a financial crisis. I don't think that there's any real major securities related reason to worry about the student loan situation. But as far as like, encumbering a whole generation with a bunch of debt, when they are at their poorest, basically, which is when you have no money, which is when you graduate from college. That just doesn't seem like good policy to me. Hmm. So bad policy, bad for the country may not cause a financial crisis. Let me give you another one. Subprime auto debt. Subprime auto debt is, yeah, I thought that had gone away. I know. It came back. And then it came back. (laughs) And you're like, wait, who's not learning their lesson? And now it's, and, and again, like on the policy perspective, this is dreadful. Like this is now like, Subprime auto debt 2.0 is so much worse than 1.0. They put these little devices in the car, which you can be like driving down the freeway and suddenly your car like turns off because it's been repossessed and you haven't made a payment. Like, no, this is not good. And, you know, asset backed debt is, you know, when it's backed by homes and cars is nasty because it's often that secure debt is often extended to people who can't get unsecured debt who mean you know who are poorer who are less likely to be able to pay it back and as we have found it's when poor people are burdened with debt and can't afford to pay it back that you start getting the really nasty economic repercussions i think the one thing i just really want to emphasize here is let's worry about the important things which is you know how is the economy going to be able to tick along how are the people who are struggling going to be able to make money make ends meet And that's much, much more important than is the stock market going to go down? Are investors going to lose money on their bond portfolios? Like, I could really care less about that. All right. We'll get back to our interview with Felix Salmon in just a minute. You are listening to Jill on Money. Uh, I'm not quitting Twitter yet because I don't really deal with it. Mark does. So follow us on Twitter. Mark is culling all of your Twitter questions and sends them to me on an ongoing basis. Sometimes I hop on and do it myself. Just follow us at Jill on Money. We'll be right back. The cure to your financial problems could be just a phone call away. 855-411-JILL is the number to dial. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. You're back with Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, an economic question, something you would like us to dive deep into, 
shoot us an email, askjill at jillonmoney.com. We're going to do a little bit more of this because uh, many of you have asked Mark whether I could go in depth on some different topics with me just blabbering on, I guess. I guess you guys are gluttons. But if there's something going on and you want to, us to go a little bit deeper, let's call it the deep dive. Let us know. We really would like to hear from you. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com, 855-411-JILL. Here's more of our interview with Felix Salmon. You know, you, you look from the, the bigger landscape, and that's why I like you talking about that student loan debt is bad for society. It probably isn't going to cause a financial crisis. I had run into, you know, what I do is basically I stalk people in the CBS green room. So I meet them there and then I, I, they're stuck with me. And then I get to ask them a question. I'm like, this is off the record, but I want to ask you a question. So I asked Ben Bernanke, I said, have we become Japan? He goes, what's wrong with Japan? Japan's doing just fine. That's literally what he said. He goes, there's no way this economy can grow faster than two or two and a half percent simply because of Number one, productivity. Number two, population. So Japan is a really fascinating place, and I, I and I totally, totally understand what he's saying. Uh, you know, it has a debt to GDP ratio of what two hundred and fifty percent or something, and apparently we're not allowed to go over ninety, or we all hit a crisis. Exactly. Like, and Japan is like, you know, exhibit A and why that's not true. So Japan proves that debt isn't particularly bad. The interesting thing about Japan is it doesn't have a huge amount of inequality. It has a population which is shrinking. Right. So it doesn't need a lot of GDP growth in order to get decent per capita GDP growth. If you have a a population which is growing, like the United States, then you need faster growth in order for any individual person or the average individual person to see the benefits of that growth. Much more important than GDP growth, though, is the distribution of that growth. And historically, for most of the 20th century, when America had GDP growth, the fruits of that would go to the middle classes. They wouldn't go to the bottom end of the economic spectrum, and especially African Americans who really got left out for most of the 20th century. And that was something which the country really hasn't made up for uh, and needs to. But equally, they didn't go to the very top end either. And in recent years, what we've seen is all of the gains going to the top, the amount of inequality in America going up year after year after year with no end in sight. And if that's what you're going to do with GDP growth, I'm like, well, no, thank you. I don't want that kind of GDP growth. I want people to do better. I want Americans to become better off. And trying to come up with policies which will help normal people rather than policies which will help rich people, which is another way of saying people with money in the stock market, you know, is is kind of, I think, where people should be concentrating. So again, if the stock market goes down, what does that mean? It means rich people get poorer. That's actually okay. It also means that if you are working right now and if you're saving for retirement, you're really happy because all of those stocks are cheap and you get to buy them cheap. And it's much better to buy stocks low than it is to buy them high. Anyone who is still working and is going to be working for another decade or two should love it if stocks go down. I say always root for a correction, root for a bear market. If you got the time, rock on, right? So in looking at anything out there that keeps you up at night, what is it? Is it is this income inequality the piece that like freaks you out? Do you, like, because I've thought so much about this. You know, when that Piketty study comes out and they they update it and then they try to figure out, you know, income inequality in France and Germany and U.S. and you look at the numbers and it's it feels so depressing, but also that nobody's really figuring out how to address this in a way that's meaningful or at least. The American population doesn't vote for people who want to do that. What is it that's going to get us out of this cycle? Okay, so there's a really simple answer to that, um, which is that, as Piketty has shown, there's a bunch of structural forces in the global economy, which have only got stronger in recent years, which tend to exacerbate inequality and make it worse and worse and worse year in and year out. So what do you do? You need to care about these things day in, day out on a structural level by 
taking the people who are lucky enough to do well in the economy and saying, well, good for you, but like, let's just take some of the fruits of that success and redistribute it to people who, for a bunch of really good reasons, haven't been able to be so fortunate. Even Lloyd Blankfein said that the middle class has to do well for the economy to improve. I mean, basically, we have to like lift everyone up from like sort of the first three quintiles down. Like if they lift up, that will improve economic growth for everyone. The marginal propensity to spend an extra dollar is extremely high if you're poor. If, if, if you have no money and I give you a dollar, you will spend 100 percent of that dollar. If you're Lloyd Blankfein and I give you a dollar, you'll go, this is great. What the hell am I meant to do with this? So if you want to cause economic activity in the country, what you do is you funnel the money to the poor who will spend it rather than to the rich who will not spend it. This is economics 101. This is not rocket science. So absolutely, you need to be able to get that money flowing, not just to the middle classes, but also to the poor. And then if you do that, that will help the entire economy. And I've now elected you president. Thank you very much. And I'm honored to serve. Thanks again to Felix Salmon. Great guest. Go check out his podcast if you want a little wonkiness. It's called Slate Money. You are listening to Jill on Money, 855-411-JILL, or send us an email, askjill at jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger takes the mystery out of your finances. All right. uh, Closing out the end of the program, uh, I I just want to point out that there are so many people who ask me about individual stocks. And gang, I am not an individual stock picker and never have been, never was good at it. Uh, What I tend to be very good at is understanding that you are probably not a great stock picker. There's probably not a lot of folks out there who can consistently beat the index. Um, And most importantly, uh, I know that you say, oh, I should have bought Apple or I could have bought Apple or I bought Apple. But but for every Apple, there's something else that you don't own, which is kind of the what I want you to remember as we close out the program. There was a once a legendary dude at Fidelity who said, buy what you know. And I think that there are a lot of people who will say, buy what you know, buy what you know, go into the parking lot of Walmart. And if you see a lot of cars there, buy Walmart. I would like to point out four companies that you probably know pretty well that had you purchased them in the beginning of 2017, you would have had a very nasty surprise. Okay, let's do the four that I like. TripAdvisor. Oh, I love TripAdvisor. I use that website all the time. Everyone uses TripAdvisor, right, Mark? It was down 25.7% in 2017, lost a quarter of its value. Oh, you know what? I went to Macy's. Macy's is great. I love Macy's. The parking lot was full. Macy's was down 30%. Uh, Oh, I love those commercials for GE. I love my GE light bulbs. I love GE. GE makes a lot of stuff. GE stock down 45% in 2017, 45% in one year. Oh, you know what I love, Mark? I love my hoodie. I love my hoodie, my Under Armour hoodie. I love my Under Armour garments. Under Armour stock, 2017, down 50.3%. Don't buy what you know. Buy an index fund and go to sleep at night. All right, that's it. That's the program. Thank you so much for listening. 855-411-JILL. That is our phone number and our email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. Instagram, uh, what else? Twitter, uh, YouTube. Is We're all over it. Jillonmoney.com. You can get links to everything. Thanks so much for listening. We'll talk to you next week.